Good morning, everybody. Welcome to church. Nice to see you. Come on, why don't we stand in every location, Mandra, Canning Vale. Welcome to church. Are you glad you're here? Did anybody force you to come? No, that means you chose to be here. So I'm excited. Um, it's been a while since we've been in Perth, but genuinely thrilled to be back. And uh, amazing. So I hope you're enjoying the person you're sitting next to. I hope they're smiling at you. I hope they're making you feel at ease. If it's your first time at church, welcome. In Mandra, I think Chris and Alex Blackman had a baby maverick. It's his first time in church today. I think our gathering is pretty much full, but you can, you can try and sneak in if you can this week with John Hanna at the convention center. Um, but if you, you can't get to gathering or it's too late or it's full, Thursday night we have presence night and it's going to be incredible. So I invite you to come out to that. And I think, I believe on Sunday, the trains are free. The things they do for us. So 10 a.m., 5 p.m. at the convention center. Don't come to your location. We're all gathering together. So amazing. Everyone happy? Yeah. It's great to have my fr great friend and the founder of this building here in Wangara, Pastor Neil Smith. He's here today. I just saw him with his mum. And uh, to everyone in Canning Vale and Mandra, Pastor Neil was the man who actually took a risk on me in ministry first. And when I was this shy keyboard player like that guy over there, he took a risk and uh, risks, that one sort of turned out relatively well. But, you know, it takes a leader, it takes a person with vision to see that. And uh, so many of the key moments of me going to Malaysia and then me coming back to Perth and uh, many, many great people along with him paid a price so that we could have this facility here in Wangara. So it's great to have you here with us, Pastor Neil. He's on holidays with his mum. Probably didn't want me to do any of that, but just I'm looking around who else I can embarrass. Great to have Chris Ham here. He works here. He had no choice. <laughs> Great to have everybody in Canningvale. Pastor Julian preached incredible at our gathering in KL. It was absolutely incredible. Let's pray. Father, we stand in awe of you. You increase, we decrease, we honor you, we value you. We thank you for your presence in this place. Thank you, God, that no one is excluded. Everyone is included. No one is so bad they can't access you. No one is so good they don't need you. So, Father, today, let every heart be good soil. Let every person in Canningvale be receptive. Everyone in Mandra be receptive. Everyone in Wangara, Bartland Central be receptive to what you want to say, what you want to do. I thank you that you are building your church not just in Perth, but around the world. We give you all the praise, all the honor. Father, let every person leave encouraged, strengthened. Lord, better for being here. And I thank you that you will have your way in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Amen, amen. amen. Why don't you take your seats? You know, when you read the Gospels, the disciples had front row access to the greatest ministry ever. And in three and a half years, they watched the dead rise. They watched the Pharisees silenced. They saw bodies change. They saw food multiply. They saw teaching. They heard application like they'd never heard in their life. And yet the one record in Scripture of the one thing they wanted to learn was, Lord, teach us how you pray. They didn't say, Lord, teach us how you teach. Wasn't Lord teach us how to win the arguments with the Pharisees and the politics? Wasn't even teach us how to heal the sick or cast out demons or raise the dead? That came with it. He just said, teach us how you pray. There's something about Jesus' prayer life they observed that awakened a desire and a curiosity to learn how to pray. And you might be like, oh, message on prayer. I know about prayer. Knowing about prayer is not going to save you. Actually praying will. You know, there's clearly a move stirring globally around prayer, and I've seen it. You know, uh, one of the saddest things about travel is to see the decimation that the enemy is doing, and yet in other parts, the move of God is flourishing and just going crazy. And my only simple conclusion between where it's flourishing and where it's not is prayer. I'll put it to you in blunt terms if you just want the bottom line. If you don't pray, you're not going to make it. The world we're in post-pandemic, the world we're in post-Christ culture in some of the countries we're in, 
If you don't have a lifeline to God yourself, not through your spouse, not through your pastor, not through your friend, not through your leader, not through your relative, not through your grandma, I'm glad they all, I'm glad they all pray. But if you don't have a lifeline to God yourself, you will not make it. You saw the 24-7 prayer ad and the scripture that we use, 1 Thessalonians, pray without ceasing. Three simple words, impossible. You've got to breathe, you've got to eat, you've got to go to work. How do you literally pray without ceasing? And then you realize Paul didn't write this to a person, he wrote this to a church. It's not possible for a human to pray without ceasing because you live. But it's possible for a church. He wrote some letters to people, Titus, Philemon. But he wrote this to the church of Thessalonica. And what is possible if a church decides to pray without ceasing? And yeah, this 24-7 thing has started. We're just launching it. Um, There's over 3,000 people already signed up to pray one hour. There's only 168 hours in a week. But if you haven't, you're like, how do I do that? It's so easy, even I did it. Without the assistance of Jemima or technology, I didn't even need a PA to help me. I did it myself. You know, some of you may recall in 2012, if you're around 2013, we launched a 24-7 prayer initiative back then. Back then, our church was about between Perth and Cale, about 3,000 people, roughly, 3,500. And we had two locations. Now, a decade on, there's a tenfold increase. Our church is tenfold in terms of the locations, the countries. the, lo- the So there is no reason, as the waters cover the sea, prayer can't cover the globe. And now, with the people in London and Africa and Dubai and the subcontinent and Mexico, they can pray in those awkward hours that we like, 2, 2 a.m. I like to sleep, 4 a.m. I still like to sleep, 6 a.m., Maybe I should be getting up, but there's something exciting and emerging. This weekend, we've got John Hanna. That guy started a prayer movement in Chicago. And I'm telling you, you just get in the room, something will shake inside of you. Because this is not a fad or a season. Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. And when he said that, he wasn't saying it because he wanted pious people. People are just like, oh, wow, my church is a very praying church. What a devout group of people. He's not asking us to be a house of prayer for the religious look. He's asking us to pray because prayer actually works. Prayer is actually powerful. Prayer actually changes things. Prayer in its simplest form is access. It's access. You know, my sons have access to our house. My sons have access to the fridge. If they ever die of starvation, it's self-inflicted. Because they have access. In the same way, you and I have access to God. And let me put it, you might understand that, but let me, uh, let me waken your thoughts around how really powerful that is. Here's what prayer does. It displaces anxiety with peace. The amount of anxious, worry, fear, paranoia that's going on in the world is understandable, but not for a Christian. It's not. It really isn't. Listen to Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything. By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, make your request known to God. And the peace, the peace, the peace, everyone say peace. Peace. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding, guards your heart and minds. So instead of anxiety, prayer displaces it with peace. Prayer displaces weakness with strength. You know the verse in Isaiah 40, they that wait upon the Lord. He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and grow weary. Young men shall utterly fall. But they who wait upon the Lord, they that focus on the Lord, they that pray shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. Think about it. If you're a believer, strength and peace is your inheritance. But it's accessed through prayer. So if you're living season after season, weak and anxious, like the starvation issue with my sons, it's self-inflicted to a degree. A Christian who's living with anxiety and weakness, to some degree, is not accessing the very thing God has made available. And prayer isn't a gift. It's not a responsibility for some. It isn't a department of the church. It is genuinely the privilege and responsibility of every believer. You don't need a cuddle, you need a prayer life. You don't need a therapist, you need a prayer life. You can have a cuddle and a therapist, I'm all for that. But get a prayer life and say, God, awaken in me the divine access you've given me privilege to. So, in case you haven't worked out, I'm pretty passionate about prayer at the moment. 
And it's not just so we sign up for an app. It's so that we actually pray. Because I've just seen the effects. And some of you have watched stuff, what's happened in the news and social media. Don't believe everything you read. But nonetheless, there's clearly a shaking happening. And only prayer is the thing that will hold you. And if you're like, well, I've lived most of my life. And it's just been my wife who's been praying. My mom. That's okay. God has been kind to you. And you made it this far. But make a decision today. I'm going to be a person of prayer. A man of prayer. A woman of prayer. A grandparent who prays. A student who prays. Let me, let me just help, because I realize we have a spectrum of people here. People are so passionate and right there, and then people are brand new going, pray, I wouldn't know what to say. L- let me start by debunking some of the myths around prayer, and let me just give you some ideas around what forms of prayer look like. Number one, prayer is conversation. It's conversation with God. I don't know if you've ever talked to someone and conversation was a one-way street. That relationship generally doesn't last that long. No nudging, just look straight ahead. Jesus even said, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they'll, they think they'll be heard for their many words. Do, don't be like them. You know, conversation is two ways. So you get to talk to God, you get to hear him. 1 John 5, 14 says this. This is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Sometimes you think you're talking to the wall, you're talking to the air, you're talking to what. When you speak to the Lord, he hears us. And you know, sometimes in this prayer, rise and move, it can get all a little complicated, a little spiritual. But I want to tell you, he hears the tax collector in the temple. He hears the thief on the cross. He hears the prayer of a child. You don't have to be sophisticated, educated, deep, understand Hebrew, Greek and Latin. Just talk to God. If a thief dying on the cross could utter some words with his last breath and receive eternal life. If the tax collector, unlike the Pharisee, literally didn't, barely raised his head and said, Father, sometimes we can over-spiritualize and yet God says, I hear the prayer of anybody who would call upon me. So I want to encourage you, start there. Start with conversation. Start by talking to God. This is why forgiveness matters. God says, if you want to talk to me, make sure you resolve all your issues with everyone else. Have you ever talked to someone you got issues with them? You're like, but I don't have issues with you. I have issues with them problem is they're all his kids you hate my kids and you want to talk to me it's going to be an awkward conversation that's why he said forgiveness matters because prayer is 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 relational prayer is actually me talking to God and God talking to me it's it's not just relational it's a declaration prayer is also a conversation see if you're like what do I pray for an hour if I sign up for this hour thing what am I going to say you're right because some of us are not big talkers I mean, come in from work. Hi. Hi, Han. How are you? Good. How's today? Good. Yeah, great. Conversation finished. <laughs> Summary done. You're like, if I talk to God about conversation, I'm not going to talk for an hour. Because I'm a male, and so is he. <laughs> I don't want to get any emails about the theology of... Just write them to Mervyn if you want so there is more than just conversation. There's a thing called declaration. L- read Mark 11, 20 to through 24. This is what it says. In the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree, the disciples, withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. Jesus was hungry. The tree didn't have fruit. Jesus said, may you never bear fruit again. And the tree died. The next day they walk in past and they found the observation. And this is Jesus turning his temporary anger moment into a teaching moment. Verse 22, have faith in God, Jesus answered. Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer. So what did Jesus call prayer? Us speaking to mountains. That's not a conversation with God. That's us a conversation with a mountain. I don't know when you remember when you had young kids or when you were young or you still play with young kids. I used to do this, probably not good parenting, but like if one of the kids would hit their head on the table, I'd hold them to soothe their tears. I'd I'd smack the table. Naughty table. And it somehow seemed to make the kid feel better. (laughs) 
And you know, the kids are like, yeah, naughty table, naughty chair. And, and it just was awesome. But you're like, oh, that's so cute as a child. And then here we come. Jesus tells us to speak to the mountain. Naughty mountain. <laughs> naughty fear. Naughty anxiety. <laughs> naughty depression. Naughty sickness. He didn't say, if anyone says to God, he says, if anyone says to the mountain. And the last time you spoke to an inanimate object was the TV when the Eagles played. Didn't change a thing. So you're like, what does this verse do? <laughs> Have faith in God. If anyone says to this mountain, he says, whatever you ask for in prayer, there's a form of prayer called declaration where we need to learn to have the courage to speak to the mountains in our life. That's why often when you hear some of the guys pray, you're like, why are they so mad at God? They're not mad at God. They've switched from conversation to declaration. When you hear my wife pray, you think, oh no, what is going on? She's not yelling at God. Tip, don't yell at God. He's fine. A, he's not deaf, B, he's kind, and he's the reason we're alive. So when you hear passion and prayer, it's often declaration. We command this thing never to take root, and people are like, that's just Pentecostalism. No, it's called declaration. It's very scriptural. If you speak to the mountain and do not doubt, say, get up, go into the sea, it will happen. It shall be done. Whatever you, and he, Jesus says, whatever you ask for in prayer, in prayer, believe that you have received it, it'll be yours. I remember showing you a picture, and we talked about this a few years ago, but some of you might not have been here, so I'm going to, but it makes the point. Have you heard of Cave Church in Egypt? And I think we spoke to the guys from the, um, I forgot their names, Persecuted Church. And what a stunning story. And the story of how Cave Church appeared was centuries ago, and the story was uh, corroborated, and I, I recently spoke to him again. And said, can I have a bit more substance around it? And the, the, it is compelling. Terrorists captured some Christians and was about to execute them and to mock them on the way to execution. Said, we're going to drag your torture out by night, essentially. Apparently your God moves mountains. Well, you have 24 hours to move this mountain or we're going to kill you tomorrow morning. And most of us would be like, um, it's a figure of speech. It's, it's more like a metaphor, like, you know, the mountain of... Of emotions and the mountain of these guys had no other plan so they prayed all night that the mountain would move there was an earthquake and the mountain moved the next day the mountain moved what you're seeing there is one of the crevices one of the results of the mountain that moved and now they run church there declaration is powerful can i hear an amen See, that's why when you, Jesus said, watch with me. Could you not watch with me one hour? He never said, watch me for an hour. Don't come to church to watch. Come to watch with God. Come to decide, God, I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to worship you. I'm going to praise you. I'm going to declare. When the word is declared, there's an amen. There's a sound of declaration that is not charismatic or Pentecostal. It is faith in action. Jesus calls it prayer. And that is where if you had an hour to pray and after you're done talking, Lord, how's your day? Good. How's my day? Great. Few problems, you know it all anyway, so amen. Conversation done, prayer finished. <laughs> then start saying, God's saying, okay, now start dealing with some of those things. Yeah. Speak to my apathy, I speak to my fear, I speak to that, to that, to that, to that bondage or to that, to that impasse, I speak to that issue, I speak to that contract that's stuck. I declare that God has given me life and death in the power of my tongue, and I'm going to speak it to move some mountains. Yeah. Have faith in God. Look at your neighbor, say, have faith in God. Faith in God looks like speaking to mountains. Having faith in God looks like, let me say that again. Having faith in God, everyone's like, yeah, I want faith in God. It looks like speaking to mountains. That's a sign you have faith in God, that you have the courage to speak to the situations in your life and believe that will, it'll change. Savior, you can move a mountain. Our God is mighty to save. He's literally mighty to do anything so long as we speak to it. And then here's the, here's the third form of prayer. There's, there's conversation, there's declaration, then there's intercession. Intercession, praying in the spirit. I grew up in a church where this was all foreign. Until we moved to Australia in 1984, and we went to the church in Canning Vale, which is now Kingdom City. And I grew up, and I, it was weird because the pastor talked to God like he knew him. And I thought that was strange because to me, God was sovereign and distant. And he talked to God as if he knew him and God would talk back to him. And I'm thinking, wow, I didn't know that was possible. 
But there was an intimacy connected to his walk with God that set off a desire in me. I had no desire to work for God, but I wanted to know him. And I'm like, who is this? How does this work? But the more I did it, I saw people speaking in strange tongues. And I thought, woo, stay away. (laughs) But I remember having this longing to know God. And I said, God, if this is real, whatever they're doing, I'll have it. But if it's not, please keep it far, far, far from me. And one day a woman was preaching, which I didn't believe in. I was nine. I was a bad teaching from the church I grew up in. She had a word of knowledge, which I didn't believe in. She called me out from the crowd, which I didn't believe in. She prayed from a distance and I hit the floor, which I didn't believe in. And I started speaking in tongues, which I didn't believe in. How many realized my belief structure needed some old shifting? How many are glad that God doesn't look at your beliefs and make them the parameter of your faith? Intercession. Everyone say intercession. Intercession. Now, this sounds a little scary, and this sounds like something that only old grandma should do. Pay attention. (laughs) Ephesians 6.18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication. Everyone say, in the Spirit. Come on, Canning Vale, say, in the Spirit. Thank you for your support. Being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Praying in the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 14.2. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people but to God. See, this is one of my issues with the speaking in tongues business. I'm like, it sounds like gibberish and it makes no sense to me. They're not talking to me. They're not talking to you. When they're speaking in an unknown tongue, they're speaking to God. And people are like, I just want God to come and just move my mouth. He, that's called possession. <laughs> Demons do that. God doesn't possess you. He partners with you. He'll use you. So you've got to open your mouth and say, Father. But see, it takes humility to pray in tongues. It takes humility to speak to tables. Prayer with pride doesn't work. So you and I are going to let go of our fears and our warped beliefs and say, Father, all I know is I want to be a person of prayer. Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. I'm so grateful for this. Guinness, sometimes you don't know how to pray. Say you've got a relational tension. Straight ahead. Like, God, am I praying, uh, heal them, kill them, (laughs) remove them, let my visa come through so I can migrate, (laughs) let their visa come through so they can migrate. I don't know what is the will of God. I'm stuck in a job situation and I'm like, is this God asking me to press through or God asking me to open the, Lord, shut the wrong door, open the right door, but what's the right door, what's the wrong door? Lord, am I praying, God, save my boss or remove my boss? What exactly is the will of God? I know I need resolution. I need something to change, but I don't know how to pray. And the scripture says, for we do not know what we should pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself. So when I don't know what to pray and I go, God, and I'm holding that position up, that situation up, that tension up that problem up, and I start to pray in an unknown tongue. You know, you don't have to be ashamed. By the way, if you come to church and you want to speak in tongues, you go for it. Yeah, but there have been new people. Yes, they think you're strange anyway. So just go for it. I used to walk through the streets and pray. The advantage with brown skin is they just think I'm speaking in some other dialect that they've never heard. They're correct. I'm speaking in another dialect they've never heard. But I tell you, an hour of prayer, there's only so long I can yell at the mountain. There's only so many conversations I can have with the Lord. Lord, how many times can you say, Father, help Manchester United get better? You can only say that for about five minutes. Lord, you don't care about the eagles, so can you care about... And, and, then, and then I start to go, I need to start praying about something serious. And I start praying. I'm praying into gathering. I don't know what to pray. Am I praying God? So I start praying in tongues. You know, this, is, this will fascinate some of you. There's a medical doctor called Carl Peterson who did scientific tests on the effect of praying in tongues on the brain and the immune system. And they found that those who prayed in tongues consistently, and that's the key, not one sentence or one little thing here and there, consistently they found their immune system was boosted between 35 and 40%. The brain releases two chemical secretions that are directed into the immune system. It's the hyperthalamus. Well, the hypoth- yeah, whatever that is, so you say that 10 times, you'll be speaking in tongues. 
I'm not a medical doctor, but before I heard about that scientific research, I believe Jude verse 20, that if we were to build ourselves up in our most holy faith, we could do that by learning to pray in the Holy Spirit. So I want you to let go. Listen, I came from other backgrounds. I came from backgrounds that would make Anglicans look like Pentecostals. So it didn't matter what your banner or your badge is. Just want God. Just go, I need to know God. Just go, I want to be a person of prayer. And I want to encourage you. Let's make intercession a part of it. And if it's never been part of your journey, start today. Start today. And um, as we wrap this, as we land this, I want to talk quickly about, I guess, what's going to shift you in your stages of prayer. Prayer starts with a decision. Some of us don't wait for today. Oh, if I start shaking in my seat, that means God's telling me to pray. He's telling you to pray. I just need a sign. Here's your sign. Pray. Pray. It starts with a decision. In fact, we're in a season of prayer and fasting leading up to the gathering. Just make a decision. Well, I haven't really done it. Start today. Start today. You can get on the website, sign up, start today. Everything starts with a decision. Amen? Can I hear that? In amen? Everything starts with a decision. But, but a decision is I choose to pray. Now, if the rest of your life, prayer is only ever a choice, something's not quite right. You imagine if you're married and every day you go, oh, I choose to be married to this woman. God, if, this is, if there's any other way, take this cup from me. <laughs> but I choose. Now, there are days you're going to have to choose. That's a fact. But if your whole life you're choosing, you're missing something about marriage that should be working. You can have an altar call right now. At some point, decision needs to graduate to devotion. Devotion is, I, I, I don't just choose, I, I'm now devoted. You know when you're devoted to someone, you're devoted to something. It's not just a one-off decision, there's a consistency. And, and your time with God is supposed to be called devotion because you're supposed to actually semi-want to do it. <laughs> there's got to be consistency. And, but even higher than devotion is desire. Imagine if prayer went from a decision to a desire. It's like, God, I, I long to do this. That's why the songwriter didn't write, this is my discipline to honor you. What a horrible life it would be. If, without discipline, nothing lasts. But if, it's, if my marriage was 99% sheer discipline and commitment and 1% love, I could be married forever. But what a miserable life. Same with your walk with God. If it's 99%, I have to, religion, force me. Oh. At some point, something needs to click and decision needs to become devotion. It needs to become desire. How does it switch from decision to devotion? It's just persistence. Maybe you're, it doesn't really matter. You might be at the decision part. And today, right across Perth, online, wherever you are, you're like, I'm just going to make a decision. Well, you just do that. Make sure you do that. But if you add persistence to your decision, it will become devotion. Any decision that you add persistence to. Jesus talked about the widow. He said, when, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith? He's talking about a nagging widow who pesters an ungodly judge. And it's really a parable about persistence. And Jesus says, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith? He calls persistence faith. Add persistence and it becomes a devotion. How do I take my devotion and tip it into the realm of desire? It's presence. When you start to genuinely commune with God and the presence of the Lord is there, nobody will need to remind you. My devotion is my desire. And in this season, my house shall be called a house of prayer is not a theme. It's the foundation of everything we're supposed to be. And I feel like today is just in a divine, it's a divine invitation for whether you need to make a decision. Maybe you're at devoted because you've got enough people around you, but God is drawing you into desire. So I would love us all to stand to our feet. Come on, right across Perth, in Mandra, Canning Vale, and in Wangara, Butler Central, wherever we are. 
Thank you, Lord. Just, I know you can have fun with the person next year in five, ten minutes, but for the next few minutes, can you forget about them? Just ignore the person on your left and right and focus on Jesus. Maybe you don't know Jesus. In a few minutes, in every location, you're going to get your chance. But the presence of the Lord is here because He's real. And where He's honored, He is. And maybe you, like, I'm just at the early point. Well, I want to tell you there's nothing like the taste of His presence that will catapult your journey. You know, here's what I want to pray. That anxiety, fear, worry, the lies of the devil, that you can't do this, it's not who you are, it's for someone else. I, I pray that drops off like wax in fire today. So I want you, if you're, there's something in you saying, God, I want you to take my prayer life to the next level. I just want you to lift your hands towards heaven in a humble, surrendered way. Come on, in a humble, surrendered way. Say, Father, I want to go deeper. I want to go deeper. I want to go deeper with You, Lord. I want to go deeper with You. And you know, I want to encourage you right now that the Lord will encounter every man, woman, young, old. You might not even be a believer, but God will encounter you if you would say, God, I'm hungry, I'm open. I just want to know, I want to grow. And so right now, cross Perth, why don't we lift our hands in every auditorium from the front to the back, from the left to the right, because we value His presence. We, we, we honour His presence. We worship Him.